Hey, 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 and welcome to the Difference Maker Revolution podcast. And this week, there's the four of us. So we've Janine, Brad, Jonathan, and myself. And this week, we're talking about creating a sustainable, successful business. And often things we see that are misunderstood in the marketplace. So I believe, guys, that the first thing that is often misunderstood is this idea that average sales value on its own is the ultimate measure of success. Janine, what's your opinion on that? Uh, I, I believe that that's a fallacy, Ronan, because uh, if you're working to build a sustainable business and a sustainable business is one that provides for yourself, your family, your team members, um, one that makes a profit and one that can stand the test of time, right? It's not just an in and out in a year or so, uh, that it's way more than just your average sales value. It's a component, of course, right? You know, but it's, there's several different, and we're going to talk about this on the podcast. There's several different key items in your process, in, in your measurements and your key metrics that all have to work together. You know, it's, it's your average sales value. It's the number of sales that you make. It's the number of people you talk to is the number of people you convert. And these numbers all work together to determine and the profitability of that sale, right? You know, so it's always so funny. Sometimes someone's average sale could be a certain number, but their profit on that number is so low. It's like, well, you would have been better off having a lower sale with a higher profit, right? So it's all these different things. But this isn't just our business. This is all businesses. You have to, you have to get the right balance of the volume, the sale, and the profit in order to make a sustainable business. But Janine, I've never seen, so I've seen this happen a lot, right, where you see it in, in forums, you see people talk about it, if you have conversations where they're saying, okay, my average sale is like five grand, it's seven and a half grand, it's 10 grand. You know, my session fee is 690. I won't get out of bed for anything less than that. You know, I'm not working with anybody. I'm not doing any work. They have to find me, book themselves in and, you know, value me. I've never seen like a plumber or a, you know, a carpenter or a hairdresser say that they're not going to work with a client because, you know, they won't get out of bed for their client because, oh, they won't spend X, Y, or Z or whatever. Like that's a lot, whole lot of crap, isn't it? Crapology, attaching your ego to how high of a sale you can make. <laughs> yes, it is, Jonathan. <laughs> I was going to say, how, how did we get here as an industry? Because we see it everywhere, right? We see this idea that, you know, and, and here's the beauty about being a profit first professional, right? I've seen beneath the bonnet of so many photography businesses now. And I've seen beneath the bonnet of photography businesses who think that it's solely about the average sales value. And we're not saying that's not important. Of course, it's relevant. But we've seen so many people who think it's solely about that and chase that and don't have a business. You know, they, they, they literally do not make money. They're up to here with debt trying to get there because they think it's all about that. So what's gone so wrong in our industry? that photographers out there think that that's the sole measure of success and think that try so hard to create the opportunity to be celebrated for that. Like what, what, what is it that's driving that in the marketplace? You know, it's interesting. And I'm sure Brad has a great opinion on this. So I'm looking forward to hearing what he has to say. Uh, but it's, it's interesting to me because I don't know if it has to go to the, if it goes down to the, uh, the ego and the art that kind of go hand in hand, you know, as photographers, uh, a lot of times people get into it for their love of the art and, and art and the price for what you sell it at kind of goes hand in hand with how good you are. And that's how people start to think on, like, I'm only good by how much people pay me. And it, and it's perpetuated by, by those who speak, those who, um, uh, are made well known. 
uh, in, you know, the, the better the photographer, the more they charge. And I'm only going to be perceived as being successful if my minimum is X and my average is Y. Uh, and, and it's perpetuated and people are chasing this and they're chasing this ideal. And yet in the process, forgetting that they have to run a business at the same time, you know, there's no good being a starving artist, you know, no one wants to be that who wants to be, you know, who wants to make money after they're dead, <laughs> you know, it's, that doesn't do you or your family any good in the now. Um, but yeah, it, it, I think it, a lot of it attaches that ego and the art um, and what they see, what they, what they view as success, because that's what they've been told is success. What's the other side of the equation, Brad? Like if, if average sales value is part of the mix, what's the other side of the equation? Well, be, before I, I just touch on that, I just want to say that I think, I think Janine's kind of hit a bit of a nail on the head there in, in the sense that, you know, we're not an industry of business owners and entrepreneurs. We're, we're an industry of photographers and artists. Um, so I think when, with that, that mentality of being a photographer and being an artist lends to valuing individual pieces of art or, or individual clients, which then lends to what that client spends and high average order is them uh, essentially worshipping what you've created. It, it's, it's linked intrinsically. Um, and, and for me, I've always had the exact opposite of that because I, I was never, I'm not a photographer, I'm not an artist. Uh, I joined my family business when I was 19 years old because I didn't want to go to college. Uh, or rather, I was taking a year out of college and never went. Um, but my dad's got, you know, going on nearly five decades of uh, of experience in the photographic industry, running a photographic business. Um, and, and for years, it never really, I never thought of it, but thinking of it now, he's got a very, a handful of friends, literally less than five people, probably in the photographic industry. That, that are probably his friend. Uh, he has a load of acquaintances, but most of those acquaintances barely know him. Uh, he's He's got, I, I'm only thinking of one friend, <laughs> realistically, that, that my dad had in the photographic industry. Um, he's got more friends now because I've made him friends. Um, but for years, we, we, we're this little isolationist bubble. Um, and, and my dad just got his head down and got work done. He wanted to run a business. He, he didn't care about being a photographer. He didn't care about being an artist. He wanted to provide for his family and operate a business. Um, and, and he scaled the business by doing that. You know, my, my dad will outwork anybody. His work ethic is incredible. Um, and looking at that now, he, he just had no exposure to it. So, and I had no exposure to it either. Um, so, so my all exposure was just operating a business that, that the only way we knew how to grow that business was getting more clients in. You know, so, so, so we went from doing like 15 clients a week up until our, our peak at doing like trying to book 36 clients a week in consistently. Um, and, and our average wasn't thousands. Our average back then was like 440 pounds, which is about $570 ish. Um, but we, we had consistency and all those sessions came. We had, we had like a 25, 30% movement rate. We, we were operating a machine, but we operated a machine that was profitable and, and earned us a lot of money. Um, and that, that's done very well for us because, because we were focused on operating a business, not, not serving, I suppose, individual clients. Not that we don't serve individual clients, but I mean that, that the whole pressure was on the individual. We were just, you know, operating a business. So when you did increase your average to like up into the thousands, like what impact did that have? Um, to, to be, to begin with, uh, vastly positive, uh, it, it enabled us to scale down and scale up at the same time. It enabled us to, you know, we like four X our average and, and like thirded our workload, but doubled studio revenue. So, so, so it, it did, did very, very well for a short period of time. I say short period of time. It did very well for like two years. Then what happened? Burnout. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's uh it's, it's funny it's, it's, it was easy operating 36 clients a week than it was operating like seven or, or, or 10 um at, at a high average um so yeah it, it, it just come I, I suppose it comes down to consistency then and at the same time just just people wanting different things in the business well it's interesting you say that because like i've always viewed it as like this like two crossing 
metrics and you're trying to find the perfect cross point, you know, the right average sale with the right amount of volume that leads to this consistent business where you can get people in consistently at the specific average. And that's always what we've kind of found, like try to aim for, like how to, how can we provide a consistent, amazing five-star experience to make our clients feel like they're part of our family, um, to make a difference for them, to create these magical moments uh, for them to experience together, do it consistently and do it at an average that works. Do you know what I mean? Uh, and so it, it's two numbers. It really is. And they have to cross at a, at a specific path. And, um, and it changes, you know, things change. And it's interesting. Like I had, so Jonathan brings up plumbers and all these other businesses, but I, you know, I always get interesting ideas when I go and do different things. So you guys know, I love going to concerts and Ronan actually got to experience a concert this past week, which is interesting. And I am so excited that he got to do that, but we went, um, we went and saw train and I don't know how many of you guys know who train is, but uh, and it was so interesting to me because for some reason during that concert on Tuesday night, it struck me because um, Pat, he did, he performed amazingly well. He entertained the crowd. He sang all of his hits. And then when he came out to do his new song, right? He's like, I know when you're a bit of band around for 25 years, people are always like, I don't want to hear your new song. I just want to hear all the hits. He's like, but we have no way of getting you out the new songs anymore. So we're going to sing it for you on our tour until you like it. You know, and anyway, he kind of made a joke about it, but it made me think, I'm like, talk about an industry where things have changed too. Um, and where they have to now change how they do things. And that's musicians, right? They used to have the radio that disseminated their work. People liked it. People promoted it. The producers promoted their music and people just bought it, right? Now they, and he was sweating his butt off in that Florida heat, right? Like working hard on a tour to push out their music because they don't have any other way of getting people to hear their new music anymore. No one listens to the radio, you know, and no one's going to stream a song that they haven't heard. Right. So it's very interesting to me. And they're artists, too, but they're businessmen. And so it's a very it's a very similar industry, I think, if you look at it that way, because they're artists, they know that their job is to entertain. They know their job is to bring happiness and joy to those that are listening. But now they have to do it in a different way. And they have to find that mix of promoting their music, getting people to buy their music and still being true to this art that they have of creating great music, you know, and so. To me, like you could be, and it's interesting, but I'm not going to name names because this is not the, the point of it, but there are artists out there, musicians out there who have had to cancel their tours because they don't get it and no one wants to go to their concerts. Their ticket prices are too high. They've gone to this diva status that they think that people should just come see me because of who I am, but they forgot who their client is and they forgot who they're trying to entertain. And I think so many photographers do this too. They forget their job is to create moments for families. Their, their job is to do X and provide it at Y, <laughs> you know, and they get lost in the ego. And anytime someone gets lost in the ego, guess what? You know, the, the fall is pretty high and the fall is pretty hard. Um, so it's very interesting. I don't know. I just had this, like, it was this thing that I had listening to him and I'm like, he knew what his job was that night. It was to entertain and get people interested in their new music. And guess what? I did. I went and I followed it. I streamed it. And it's and it's almost like a grassroots effort for musicians now. And it's the same thing for photographers. You know, we know we we have to know what our task at hand is and what we're here to do um, and who we're here to create magic for uh, and then go out and do it. I think the topic today that we wanted to talk about was like consistency. And like the secrets to consistent business and people might be confused because they might be saying, well, why are you talking about average sale? And I think we're talking about average sale is because I find sometimes if you have a higher average sale, it's actually a, your attitude to that can be a detriment to consistency because you start taking on the belief and attitude that I won't get out of bed for less than this. I won't work with this person. And really, that's going to limit the success of your business. It's going to limit your ability to get clients in because there's going to be a sweet spot. And 
Hey, you use like my you spot. said. Thank you. Yeah, yeah it's, it's the sweet spot, yeah. the X Y <laughs> axis, right? It's the same with anything. Just supply and demand. It's just life. But you know, if you approach that attitude, you're not going to do the work that's required to stay consistent. And one of the keys to consistency that you guys have both discovered is proactive marketing. And with proactive marketing, you have to understand the art, understand the art of prospecting. And prospecting in, involves generating leads, generating inquiries, and having conversations with people who won't be your ideal client. And I feel like people waste, it's funny, like people don't want to waste their time having conversations with people who aren't instantly ready to spend 5K, 10K, right? What they don't realize is that the secret to not wasting their time is to actually have those conversations. Because by having those conversations, you give yourself the ability to create that great client, but you also give yourself, by having more of those conversations, you find more of those people that you can turn into people who will spend 5K, 10K. And that's what just doesn't, that I think people just aren't getting. You know, they want every single person that they speak to, to value photography and value them and be ready with their credit card there on the first phone call to tap for 10K. That's not how any business works. Yeah, but that's because, Jonathan, that many people have attached their ego to an average order value or average sales value, depending on what language you want to use, that costs them more to achieve than the sale is actually worth. So they've attached their ego to the wrong thing. You know, um, and th and that's why, you know, when somebody tells me their average sales value, the first thing I say is how many clients did you serve last year at that average? And very quickly, I can calculate for you what they pay themselves out of that business, provided that they manage to achieve those numbers in a profitable way, you know, that their operational expenses just weren't totally out of kilter. But you know what? When I look beneath the bonnet, regardless of the average, right? that the average on its own, what I can tell you, is the average on its own is not a measure of success. Attaching your ego to that is just attaching it to the wrong thing. And there's an old saying, um, you know, turnover is vanity. Like, and that didn't come from the photography industry. That's been around across all businesses. Turnover is vanity, profit is sanity. And as we've always added to it, cash flow is reality, you know, and it's funny the way sometimes we just attach our ego to the wrong thing. We made, we make lousy decisions. When I say lousy decisions, I mean lousy business decisions based on something that's just not real. You know, that's just, just not real. The, the other side of, now the other side is John, let me finish on this. The other side of that, that is, is that yes, you need an average at a certain level, right? Multiplied by the number of clients you're going to serve and are going to spend money with you to make business sense. So we're not saying it's not important. But we're just saying is you can't look at it on its own. You cannot attach your ego to that on its own. Instead, attach your ego to making a difference to your clients. Your clients will spend money with you. Yeah. And just serve as many clients as you can you know, within a particular cost base to deliver you a profit. I think it comes back to what Janine was talking about. And Janine just nailed it on the head earlier, which, because I have the same opinion, is that, you know, you because as an artist, you attach, you think people are buying photography for your art. So if you get a higher sale for that, you're attaching the worth and how good you are as a photographer to the value of that piece of art that you sold. But really, why high sales don't impress me is for me, high sales are a result of four things. Number one, your pricing. Number two, how confident you are at selling at those prices. And number three is demographic area that you work in. And number four is the experience you've delivered your client. For me, they're the four, four things that affect what you can sell you know, a folio box for, or a wall collection for, or an album for. It's confidence, it's your pricing, it's your demographics, and it's your uh, experience that you've delivered to the client. 
and for me, that's why I think it's misplaced because you need, if you have a higher average sale and you deliver experience and you're willing to be consistent and proactively market and stay adaptable and do the hard things, yeah, a higher average is going to be better for your business ultimately, right? But you can't... I disagree. I disagree. Uh, if your th- cost of goods I, I are in kilter, yes. No, no. If you've the volume of clients, consistency on its own doesn't mean you're going to have a volume of clients. You need to have a volume of clients that you serve who spend that amount with you and that that then that total sales number less your cost of goods aligns with a profitable business because like like i've seen Jonathan businesses where you know operational expenses are running at 75 percent of total sales right and they have high averages right that's still not a successful business now, if you have to, if you have to have the resource to deliver that average, right? That means it's seventy-five percent of your sales. Well, then you're not going to, you're not going to do it either. Way. But the other side of that is, you see people who say, "I have an average sale at twenty-six thousand. How many sales did you have last year? One. That's not going to be a business either, unless it's a part-time thing on the side, right? But but for some reason, in our industry, someone hears twenty-six thousand, say, "Wow." They must be really, really, really successful and have an amazing business. I guess I was saying the same thing as you. I just didn't define it clear enough. For me, consistency is volume of clients. You know, that you can consistently book clients. So we were saying the same thing. All right. So how you know how does the industry change how it looks at all these things, guys? What do we need to do that 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 to that photographers start to understand these things, you know, that it, it is a formula. And when you only measure one piece of the formula, it's not enough. Because it's not fair, like, it's not fair, is it? That they think that that, you know, if there's people out there who genuinely think this, and I see so much in our industry where that's what's celebrated, that's solely what's celebrated, and the other questions aren't answered, asked. You know, like, like, how do we, how, how do you change that? It's, it's hard to change, but people are ingrained thinking. It's almost like a grassroots effort that we have to go out there and, and, and get people to understand, but they're going to have, it's like, at some point, a photographer who runs a business has to decide if I'm going to make this business survive and I'm going to claw and I'm going to dig and I'm going to get greedy and I'm going to do what I need to do to, to run my business or go get a job somewhere. You know, it's, you can't, you can't run a successful business just on ego. You have to make choices on if you're going to run your business or if you're going to be just an artist. Um, And that's why I brought up the music example, because, you know, if they want to succeed in the industry, they have to work, they have to go out and they have to do things a little bit different. They have to get dirty and they have to promote and they have to do all the things that they might not have had to do before to survive as a business because they are a business. And photographers are the same. If you want to survive as a business, you got to do what's necessary to survive as a business. And you better figure it out quickly or you will have to go get a job somewhere else. <laughs> so I like, but that doesn't answer your question as to how do we change that mentality? Um, I mean, I think we provide the information and we talk to people and we podcast and we get out our grassroots efforts to get people to think about it and understand like what what is important to you do you want to run your business do you want to provide for your family do you want to create magical moments for as many people as you possibly can with your art and your gift uh or not i suppose my answer in short is we probably can um that that is it's down to the individual photographer we, we we can we can preach as much as we want and we can create training for it but ultimately and the only thing that's going to generally motivate a photographer to train ingrained beliefs is pain. Um, so, so you can't hit the nail on the head when you said they have to make a decision, you know, whether they're going to make this a business, they're going to make it work, whether they're going to use it to provide for the family, or they're just going to give it in and go get a job. Uh, and it's that at, at, at that crossroads that the individual photographer can make their independent decision and then they can, you know, we're here. <laughs> so, so if anybody's listening, you're making those decisions and you want to really make a go of it and you want to change those beliefs to actually make this work for so you can provide for you and your family then, then we're the right people to come talk to until that point like like we can 
we'll talk it until you're ready. Um, uh, then when you're ready, you can come and, and we'll help you. Uh, and then and before that, it's people who aren't already ingrained in, in the industry who don't have those beliefs. But that's my dad. My dad had no time. He had he had zero time to, to go network with the, with the photographers and talk about work. He just wanted to go make money. That was just his sole focus. Operate a business, take me to Florida every year. Uh, that, that was it. Uh, then it became take Brad to Florida for, and fly first class every year. That, 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 that were it. That was his mindset and mentality. And that's what we did for, you know, I don't know, realistically. And I mean, we're still going to Florida now. So, <laughs> so, so for 30 years, he's, he's been delivering on that promise. But that's what he's focused on. So, so when you're ready to change those beliefs, um, we're here. And I suppose Jonathan can do a better sale of that at the end, can't you, Jonathan? Before you say that, though, that was the result of your dad, right? Your dad has always been focused on delivering for the client, right? I, I'm, I'm hesitant in that answer because, you know, I have to try and think of my dad when he was my age, um, you know, rather than think of my dad as he is now. But, you know, he's, he's always been client focused, always been client driven, even before any of this difference maker revolution, even, even before we kind of like coined our little part of the industry and, and put our stamp on it. But finally that he's always been heavily client focused because if you're not heavily client focused, you're not going to run a profitable business, especially in the, in the years before proactive marketing or rather, especially in the years before digital marketing, um, when a lot of marketing was more grassroots and it was reliant on referrals and, and being the photographer in the town center was a thing, you know, when he used to be able to get work from that. So, so yeah, I, 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 yeah. I'm going to go a little bit down a, a different alley on this now, right? But you mentioned, Brad, about, you know, that sometimes people have to hit rock bot bottom before they want to change, right? And then we can bring that to a collective, you know, we can bring that to a total collective for the industry. And, you know, the, the experts who study the rise and fall of empires, right? say that that's typically, you know, can be anywhere between 220 and 300 years, right? Mm -hmm. And if we think of when the first photograph was taken in 1832, I think it was, you know, we could be in the final stages of the empire in terms of what we think photography is. And that, you know, typically at the end of an empire, there's a revolution. And that's what we're about, right? The Difference Maker Revolution. So Jonathan, bring us home and tell everybody, before it's too late, join the revolution. So for those listening who do have a great average sale, but you just don't have consistency. And for those of you who don't think you have a great average sale and you want a higher average sale and consistency, then the place you need to be is the difference maker in your circle because we are going to teach you how to celebrate what actually matters. We're going to show you how to celebrate your client. And when you celebrate your client and when you make a difference to your client, that's when the consistency comes. That's when the money comes. That's when you become a successful photographer. So inside the inner circle, we teach you how to create a client transformational experience that is going to wear your client. You're going to deliver a five-star experience to your client. We're going to show you how to attract clients, how to turn them into bookings, how to turn those bookings into sessions that show up, and how to turn those sessions into clients that willingly spend money on their family, on themselves. And as a result, you're rewarded with your high average sales. So to join, just click the button below, schedule a call, and we can't wait to see you inside the inner circle where finally you're going to have some consistency and a successful business. We'll see you on the next one. Bye for now.